Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Jim Thorpe was born in the late 1880s in what was then known as Indian Territory, now the state of Oklahoma. Thorpe, who was predominantly of Native American descent, was a member of the Sac and Fox Nation. However, his father, who had some European blood, felt that it was important for his son to attend school and assimilate into the English-speaking culture. After a series of tragic personal losses, including the death of his twin brother and his mother, Thorpe was eventually sent away to school by his father, who wished for him to get an education. Despite his hopes of staying home and his general dislike for school, Thorpe eventually traveled to Pennsylvania, where he attended the Carlisle Indian School. It was there that his extraordinary athletic ability was first noticed. Thorpe went on to excel in many different sports, including baseball, football, and track and field. He attended the 1912 Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden, where he won two gold medals for the pentathlon and the decathlon, becoming the first Native American to win a gold medal for the United States. Sadly, those medals were later rescinded when it was discovered that Thorpe had briefly played for a minor league baseball team for a small amount of money. In 1982, almost 30 years after his death, his gold medals were restored to his family. However, Thorpe remained listed in the record books as co-winner of those events. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we will be speaking with Jim Kosakowski, the great-grandson of Jim Thorpe. Jim will share stories from the life of one of America's most iconic athletes and will also share what it is like to be descended from the legendary Jim Thorpe. Please note that in July of 2022, shortly after the recording of this interview, the International Olympic Committee restored Jim Thorpe's name as the sole gold medal winner of pentathlon and decathlon events at the 1912 Olympic Games in Stockholm. I'd now like to welcome Jim Koslikowski to our show. Welcome, Jim. Hi, James. How are you? Well, I'm fine, thank you. Very happy to have you on the show to talk about Jim Thorpe. Now, I want to start by saying that As a child, my dad used to tell me a lot of bedtime stories. And whereas my mother would tell me the Hansel and Gretel, uh, Little Red Riding Hood stories and stuff like that, my dad used to tell me stories about World War II (laughs) and famous athletes. One of the famous athletes who he used to tell me about was Jim Thorpe. So as a little kid, I, I knew who this person was, who this amazing person was. So Tell us, Jim, how exactly are you related to Jim Thorpe? So he's my great-grandfather, my grandmother on my mother's side's father. So Jim, tell us, who was Jim Thorpe? Where was he born? And what was his family of origin like? Yeah, so he was born in Oklahoma Territories. He was born on the Sac and Fox Reservation. His mother was Sac and Fox. His father, Hiram was of mixed descent, but uh, mostly English. And he came from the Connecticut areas down across the Mississippi into uh, Oklahoma territories. Great. So what was Jim's early life like? So growing up in Oklahoma, he was on a reservation. They had a ranch. Uh, he worked He worked the farm with his father, got to hunt and fish. He had a twin brother. Mm-hmm. Um, so growing up, that's what uh, he knew. Him and his brother would do pretty much everything together. Work the farm and hunt, fish, swim, run. Did he have a big family? A lot of brothers and sisters? He did. He did. He came from a large family. Not, not all the children at that time made it into adulthood, hmm. um, but he did have nine brothers and sisters. He did. And they had to kind of make their own fun most of the time, I guess, huh? Absolutely. They really enjoyed the outdoors. Definitely. And there were some signs early on 
that Jim was athletic, right? He enjoyed sports, right? Yeah, absolutely. So being a twin growing up, they had competitions all the time. He did show some great skills. When he did get to school, the smaller schools, they could realize that at, at that time that uh, there was some athletic ability there. There was some potential. So, so I understand that Jim Thorpe's dad sent him away to uh, some uh, local, what they would call Indian schools. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, correct. So being mostly on the reservation and at that time, understanding that at some point in time, we have to start integrating with the American cultures and, and, and other groups that are around us. I think Hiram really pushed them to learn English, learn how to speak English. That was part of his culture. So I think he had somewhat of advantage going to those schools, having a father of that descent. But Jim didn't much care for school, did he? Yeah, Jim, Jim was more of uh, the natural guy. He wanted to go out and, and hunt and fish and play. But having his brother Charlie there with him at that younger age, you know, made it palatable for him. Yeah. And then there was some tragedy there, right, in his family in his early years? There was. There was. His, his brother passed away when he was nine years old, and that really put an effect on, on Jim and, and what he was doing. And, yeah, it was a rough time for him there. Oh, I can only imagine how close they were as twins. And as you said, they went away to school together. At least he had his brother, and now he didn't have his brother. So so what happened then to Jim? So he, he did have a harder time uh, staying in school. He kept going back to the farm. His dad had taken him there. He wanted, wanted him to go back to school, so he had to send him further and further away. He would go to the Haskell Institute there in Kansas. His father would force him to go back, and he would continue to come back. But... At those times, at those schools, he started seeing some of the American sports that were, were starting to be developed and played, which interested him a lot. So when he's seeing these sports and, and seeing that there's something there, it's kind of taking him away from his uh, woes back at home, missing his brother. Now he's got something to kind of push himself for. He's showing great skill. So word's getting out that, hey, if, uh, if you want some competitive uh, individuals take a look at these kids. And that's kind of where some of the words that uh, came back from the Pennsylvania area, the Carlisle Indian School was just starting up and had a really good athletic program during their recruits for their um, Native Americans. They would go visit these schools and see what kind of talents there. So he, he was asked to head towards uh, Pennsylvania. Carlisle, Pennsylvania is a long way from Oklahoma. So it's, it's funny to think that that long ago, there was such tight communication between places that were so far away from each other. So he ends up going to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to what was called a, an Indian school that uh, was going to help, I guess, to, again, assimilate the Native Americans into the culture. That was the, the point of it or, or part of the reason why they had those schools. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so now he's out there, but it wasn't like he jumped right into sports there. There was a sort of a process that he had to go through. And uh, could you tell us about that when he got out to Carlisle? So when the new Indians would come into the Carlisle Indian School program, they would first do what they considered an outing program, where they would go live with families in the area and uh, start that process of uh, learning the cultures and, and learning how the Americans were were raising uh, their families and how they worked the farms and how they did that stuff. So he spent three years in the outing program and then finally landed at the Indian school in 1907. So now, again, he's with the families who were, I guess, predominantly European descent. To your knowledge, was there any consideration given to what culture he came from, or was it sort of to change them or to, you know, sort of just integrate and be a mixture of both? Do you know at all about that? Yeah. So the, the motto of the school was to kill the Indian and save the man to kind of get them away from their heritage and, and, and their ways. It was trying to, to bring them to assimilate them in, into the, the culture. So yeah, it's a, it was not easy for, for most of them, but for Jim coming from a, a mixed descent, 
he had a little easier time with it. Didn't like it. Didn't like working the farms uh, for people that he that weren't family. He would have much rather been back home on his farm, but uh, he was kind of obligated to do so. Yeah, as you mentioned, his dad was of mixed descent, but that his mom was was full of Native American, right? But didn't his mom pass away? His mom did pass. So before he accepted the time at the Carlisle uh, schools, three years before his mom, his mom had passed. So he lost his brother in 1896 and his mother in 1901. So um, double tragedy. And now his dad is saying, hey, off you go to school. And as he said, he, he kept running away. So he kept, I guess, sent him further away. If he sends him to Pennsylvania, it's going to be a lot harder for him to walk home, right? It is. It is. He, yeah. That was the goal for his dad was to get him to a school that uh, he couldn't just come home to. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so sad when you think of it now about, you know, it's fine to learn new things, but to sort of, as you said, like, you know, kill, sort of kill his culture, or any ties to his culture is very sad to think about when you look back and how difficult it must have been to, you know, you're being separated from your culture, you're being separated from your family, and now you're being put into this school. But he did have this amazing athletic ability. And he also, as you mentioned, you know, his dad, there was some advantage he had from his dad in that I think he, he was able to speak the English language very well and things like that. So he, he kind of had a, a leg up on some of the other students who, who may not have had those advantages. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it was much easier for him. And I think he was actually able to help some of his classmates and everything handle some of that difficulties. And I think a lot of the kids there looked up to him a little bit because he was very athletic and skilled and talented. Yeah, so that's a good segue into his uh, athletics. So when he came back from what you called this outing program where he was staying with a family or families, uh, he comes back in and he starts to play some sports. So how does that go? What, what happens when he starts to get involved in sports? Yeah, so, it, you know, in 1907 – when he finally gets his chance to play on the uh, Carlisle Indian School teams, they see his speed on the track field, um, his ability to jump. He was just a, a very good track athlete. And it was pronounced that, hey, I want to keep him in track. Mm. But Jim having some desires, he wanted to play some football and saw the other kids playing it, saw the advantages that came from uh, being part of that football team. And he really wanted to do it. 1907, he wasn't quite as uh, mature as some of the other guys. Uh, he was a little bit smaller, still hadn't fully matured yet. And, uh, but his speed and abilities were just unmatched there. So even though he was little, he was able to accomplish a lot there. And they couldn't deny him from playing football because he was so, so skilled. Yeah. Yeah. Now I understand that his, uh, his Physically, he grew a lot and got a lot bigger and stronger, which was made him even more awesome as an athlete, right? Yeah, absolutely. So 1907, he's still finding his way, learning from some great coaching. You know, Pop Warner was his coach there for track and football, an amazing coach to have. Right, I bet. And then he, he actually starts to play a little baseball too, doesn't he? What, what happened there? So he was able to play, he was on a track team, was able to play football, baseball, and basketball for Carlisle. And he tended to drift towards baseball um, because there was some professional baseball leagues out there. There were some avenues that, uh, that meant something after school. Really? So did he end up joining a professional baseball team? Yeah. So in 1909 and 1910, his third year at Carlisle, some of his teammates were, were going down to play summer ball uh, instead of going in the outing programs where during the summer that they would go work on farms and everything. These guys decided to go down and play some, some baseball down in North Carolina the East Carolina Rocky Leagues. And how did he do down there? Yeah, he did surprisingly well. Being a pitcher helped him a lot. So he was able to make um, the team there. And 
he enjoyed it very much, uh, enjoyed the competition, and that's what he, he loved to do. So instead of working over the summer on the farms, he got to play some ball. Which he loved. But I understand his coach, Pop Warner. Pop Warner, that's something I've heard about all my life. Pop Warner football. I know like junior leagues and things like that. You hear Pop Warner. But, but Pop Warner knew right from the start that Jim Thorpe had a lot of potential for track, that he was a really fast runner. So what happened then? Did Pop sort of brought him back to Carlisle to start training? Yeah, so during, during those, that 1909, 1910 seasons, Jim decided that he didn't want to go back to Carlisle. He, he was enjoying the baseball and hoping to make it into the majors. You know, he was really hoping to show his skill at that. And wasn't as happy with the Carlisle Indian school that uh, kind of was home to him for, for the previous three years. Mm-hmm. He was missing his family, you know, uh, all those things. So those two seasons were very difficult for him. He, so he played ball. And then when he was done, he would go back home to the farm mm-hmm. and had no intentions of going back to Carlisle. Right. But, but he did. He did. So <laughs> You know, that those contacts back at the school who had met him and saw him in Oklahoma, um, word got back that Jim was in Oklahoma and in amazing shape and just uh, uh, had matured so well. He's he's a superstar here. You, you We've got to get him back. Right. So they made sure uh, he made his way back to Carlisle. And he started training for the Olympics. Yeah. So with his speed and agility uh, just unmatched. He- Pop Warner knew that he could make the Olympic team and really, really do some great things. Yeah, so so Jim Thorpe goes on to compete in the 1912 Stockholm Olympics. And he competes in both the decathlon and the pentathlon. So how did he do in Stockholm? You know, I don't think there's been an athlete that performed to that level. He won gold medals in the decathlon and the pentathlon so far ahead of his competition. They were just amazed by his athletic abilities at the Olympic level, at the world level. Um, Just an amazing trip he had there in Stockholm. Um, Yeah. Unprecedented. So he he just blew them away. Absolutely. Now he's an Olympic champion. So he comes back from Stockholm. What happens then? Yeah. So upon his return, you know, they have parades for him in, in New York and in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, amazing accomplishments, just recognition like crazy. He's not familiar with this. You know, he's, he comes from a small Indian school. He, he doesn't know why everybody knows his name and sees him, waves to him when he's walking down the street. It's just a, a change in, in his life, uh, his lifestyle. But upon his return, he, he did get married mm-hmm. to my uh, great-grandmother. And uh, yeah, it was a whirlwind. So when he did come back, he still had football season to to finish up. Oh, okay. All right. So he wins the Olympic golds and then comes back to play at Carlisle, the football season where they're able to capture a national championship, a co-national championship. (laughs) Just that, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So coming from the fast, speedy guy, back to the football field, to the gridiron, where, where he's uh, with the big boys uh, playing at a national level and all American there as a halfback and just showed his skills on the football field. So did he end up when he came back from the Olympics, he, did he end up actually playing professional baseball and football? So after the Olympics, when he returned, he finished up his college season there and then was getting offers to play multiple different sports with his fame it really brought him some some credits and people really want him to to perform for him so uh the new york giants were were his best offer to play professional baseball which was kind of you know at that time it was an an established professional league where people could earn a living playing ball uh what he loved to do so so he accepted that offer all right so now he's in he's playing some pro sports but let's talk about the Olympics. So he won two gold medals and 
I understand that there was some controversy about the medals and the semi-pro or pro ball that he had played down in North Carolina. Could you talk to that? Yeah. So the U S Olympic committee in 1912 uh, at the time was the AAU, the American amateur athletic union. They found out that he had played semi-professional ball and decided to withdraw him from the games and strip him of his gold medals. I would imagine it would have been devastating to him. Do you know how he took that or how that impacted him at that phase of his life? Yeah, it was, uh, it was tough to handle. Um, he, he didn't understand that there was any wrongdoings at all, and there were none. So like me today, I, I, I can't put my head around why, why they would strip him of his medals. He played semi-pro baseball, and he won on a track and field events. Uh, makes no sense to me. It's like if I, if I was a professional ice skater and uh, I won the shot put in uh, the Olympics and then they would take it away from me because I competed professionally, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. Right. Now, fast forward, those medals were restored, weren't they? They were. In 1982, the International Olympic Committee restored his medals to the family uh, unfortunately, his records in the record books are still not fully to the days the event ended. Mm-hmm. They're, he's a co-champion there still. Gotcha. Now, you were obviously quite young back in the early 80s, but do you recall the family's reaction to those medals being restored? Uh, yeah. My, so my grandmother, uh, we, were, we were down uh, in Los Angeles at the games there. Uh, when, when the IOC returned those medals, uh, the family was so pleased to see that happen. I actually have my grandmother's medal in my collection under my care for my family here. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, an amazing feeling to see that they were returned. But the hard part is, is it's not finished. It wasn't complete. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a wonderful feeling and so thankful that it, it was they were returned. But his records aren't aren't in place. So it's just a partial. Yeah. A par- partially restored, partially made right. is what you're saying, right? Exactly. Yeah. Jim passed away in 1953. So obviously he did not ever get to experience getting those medals restored, but he, but he moved on. Yeah. So pro baseball was a challenge for him. Mm-hmm. Um, he actually went on a world tour with the New York giants and Chicago white Sox in 1914. An amazing trip, just the fun that came out of that. But, you know, Jim, obviously being one of the, the attractions, world-renowned athlete here. Mm-hmm. So every, every place that they would go, they were asking him for his autographs and, you know, uh, can you come eat dinner with us? And, you know, just a, an amazing trip for them from the baseball world. I don't know that uh, there's been a tour like that ever since. So the tour to end all tours, I think is a book that was written about this event, but he was part of it and a big draw for that. So pretty cool. I think so. So I'm imagining, I'm thinking back that he was one of a, of a large family on a reservation out in Oklahoma territory. I imagine they must've been very poor, that many children. <laughs> and here he is being honored on a world tour as one of the most uh, famous athletes of all time. So that must have been incredible for him. But it seems like he was a, from what I understand, what I've read or heard, he was a pretty humble guy, though, wasn't he? Very humble. Um, You know, he would come home, visit his family, go out to breakfast, uh, and just enjoy, you know, everybody that would come, come up to him and talk to him. Just, you know, very, very loving, caring person. Yeah. So, but on top of baseball and being this renowned athlete, he also became involved in the early days of professional football, the national football league. Didn't he get involved with that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Was one of the five people in, in the room when they decided to come together and make a professional football league. It was another reason why Jim Thorpe being the legend he was, the athlete that he was not just a baseball player. He's got this ability to play football too. Now this football thing is taken off. It's really a lot of people 
are coming out to watch these teams come into town. Hey, I want to go see the game. Um, it's really drawn crowds like you wouldn't believe. And if you got Jim Thorpe coming in into town, boy, the whole town's going to show up to, to meet him and see what he can do. So he was part of uh, the startup of pro football. And I think he was a pivotal player in launching that sport. Yeah, I mean, from a marketing standpoint, I would imagine having Jim Thorpe there uh, sort of announcing it and, you know, promoting it must have been really terrific. It was, uh, hey, here's Jim Thorpe and here's this new league and this is going to be really exciting. So this is the very, very early days of the NFL. And certainly we can see how far the NFL has come since then. And I do know, though, that you know, as the years went on and, and Jim was involved in all these sports, as he got older, he sort of uh, was not competing as much anymore. And years went on. And of course, this country ran into some tough times, the Great Depression. The Jim was was kind of forced to do other things as well. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. So, you know, being a famous athlete at those times, the travel is very difficult, right? So his family... Um, my family somewhat saw his presence at the homestead, not as, not as popular. So there were some trying times there. Jim and Iva got divorced. He remarried, had four, four boys with his second wife, but again, his travel commitments and him moving all over the country was very difficult on the family. So they wound up getting a divorce also. So his travels and not having the, the airplanes flying all over like we do today, where we can get across the country in four hours, makes it very difficult to make a living. But yet he still has two families to support. And so that's what he has to do. So during the Depression, as some of his sporting stuff is not as fruitful as it was in the past, he has to take on some positions that are uh, less of his stature. But uh, for him, it was important because... That's what he did. He supported his family. So he did what he had to do. I, I read that he had to dig, he actually dug ditches at one point that he did some, he did some acting too. Can you tell us about that? Once his family moved, um, he had moved all over the country. So my family wound up in Oklahoma territories. His second family was Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and then moved out to California. So while he's in California is when in the neighborhood there, they're building a, a, a hospital and he needs the work. So he goes in and starts digging foundations and things for, for the hospital build. He works at different businesses doing security works, um, stuff like that. Anything he can do to put food on the table for the family. And while he was in California, he was fortunate enough to get some parts in some of the Native American films the uh indian films at the time and uh he did quite a few movies there i just have a few here that i see he played an umpire in the 1940 film newt rockney all american and as you said he was in a, he was in a bunch of different films mostly small very small parts but he was also portrayed in a 1951 movie called Jim Thorpe, All-American, starring Burt Lancaster. So it was, it was his story in a movie in 1951. So Jim, your great-grandfather, was still alive in 1951. So that must have been pretty cool for him to watch one of the most famous actors of the time portray him in a very popular movie, I bet. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it was an interesting movie. I'm not a huge fan of the movie uh I, i've seen it i think it's great i think it, the concept of doing a film on his life was really cool i just think it could have been done a little closer to what reality was i think there's some things in there that they uh, uh tried to do to make a story uh that really wasn't there yeah when you look back at it you say how real was it and of course you have somebody who, who was not of native american descent playing Jim Thorpe, but it would be interesting if they did a remake of that. Yeah, I would love to see that happen. Yeah, and have you as a consultant to the movie. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but uh, for sure, I think the story's interesting enough to tell. And uh, the deeper we dig in, into some of his accomplishments and 
some of his life, I think you'll find some very interesting stories. I'm surprised that nobody's done it yet. So what about Jim's later years? I know he, he wasn't all that old when he passed away, but what do you know about his sort of his, his last years? So his last years were spent in California. He was married for his third time. They didn't have any children. And I think she really influenced him to try to promote him. But Jim wasn't one to, you know, he wanted to provide for his family, but not to, uh, didn't want to be under the microscope, I guess. He was more of, you know, he was a nature guy. He loved being out hunting fish and stuff like that. He loved hanging around with his friends and, and close friends, but being under the spotlight wasn't his most favorite thing. Yeah. He'd had enough of that probably. Yeah. I mean, his accomplishments were so great. There was no doubt that people were going to want to be close to him and talk to him and, and be part of that. But uh, he was a very quiet, humble guy. I mean, definitely. So strictly from the family standpoint, what are the recollections of him as a dad, as a grandfather? So my grandmother would always tell me when he would come into town, they were just amazing days. You know, he did have family. Uh, she, she grew up in Oklahoma and his family was also in Pennsylvania, Ohio, in California at times. So his traveling was very difficult for him. So she didn't get to see him as often as she would have liked. But when, when he was there, she just absolutely was amazed. Loved to be around her dad. Loved the type of person he was. A caring, loving guy. Loved his kids. Enjoyed his time with, with them. Just a, a, good, a good father. Difficult. Many say that, well, you know, he, he abandoned his family. He, he was away. Back at that time, being one of the most famous athletes out there, your time spent all over the country, um, that takes away time with your family. It wasn't like today's world where we could do that. So, you know, it was difficult for her not having her dad with her every day, but she really did appreciate the time she got to spend with him and how loving and caring he was is what, what she expressed to me. That's really good to hear that. Cause as you mentioned, he was a famous athlete and in order to, particularly in his later years, when he was maybe not playing in the sports anymore, perhaps, and, uh, but he still had the fame that was his bread and butter. That's how he lived. He, he needed to promote his legacy by going around and speaking and seeing people. And, and if he didn't do that, the money would dry up. So all in all, it sounds like the fact that he, he was able to make an impact positively to his, to your grandmother uh, does speak to the fact that when he was there, he was present and she remembers him fondly. Yeah, absolutely. And then the stories also go back to my mom and, and her cousin, Mike Kohler. I think Mike was closest with him. You see him in photos, family photos uh, all the time, hanging with grandpa. So uh, it was always kind of cool to see I got to talk to Mike Kohler a lot because uh, he lived close to us. And again, one of the people I idolized and looked up to, he was a very good athlete himself, played college ball. He was a, a mentor. He was a, an athletic counselor, an assistant athletic director at Deerfield High School, and just a wonderful person. I think he was probably the most knowledgeable person while I was growing up of Jim Thorpe. And he got to talk to him, got to hang with him. It was just, it was great talking to Mike about him and some of the stories that he talked about with, uh, with his, his grandpa. What's so nice is when I speak to people on this podcast is, uh, particularly when I'm talking with descendants of well-known people, I always like to hear the perspective of the family, not just the public perspective, but what was the family's perspective? What things were handed down? Now, you found out very early in life that you were descended from Jim Thorpe athletically how did that affect you when you were going to school and with your own athleticism how did it impact you well i mean i think i got some good genes that's for sure uh <laughs> i was uh i was small like like jim uh, all through high school and into college is when i finally matured a little bit and grew up a little bit but i was fortunate enough to uh play football baseball and wrestle all through high school i wrestled into college Really enjoyed wrestling. Uh, it was my passion. And uh, I was lucky enough to qualify for the 92 Olympic trials. Really? And I didn't quite make the team, but uh, 
I gave it everything I had. Qualified. That's the thing. No. So when you were wrestling and playing sports, did it, did you almost feel like he was watching you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, uh, my competitive nature never let me think about stuff outside of it. So I would get into those zones there, but when you walk off and you get to reflect on it, yeah, I, I sure hope he was watching down on me and, and give me some help there on the field. That was for sure. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it's an incredible feeling being part of a family like that and being part of a legend. It's just an incredible feeling. And I understand that DNA is passed on to your children too, that they're very athletic. Yeah. So my, my oldest is a softball player. She would say now she's a registered nurse uh, <laughs> and she's, she's a great one too. Um, but yeah, she was competing uh, in the NCAAs for uh, Northern Illinois university division one college athlete, uh, four year starter, amazing hitter. I, I still watch in one of her, her Mac championship games. Uh, she hit a grand slam. I'm tearing Aww. up. It's, uh, Aww. It's, yeah. Proud moment. Proud moment. I know what you're talking about. I mean, my, my grandson came in first in a freestyle the other night at, on a swim team and I was tearing up because I was just so proud of him, you know, and, it's amazing. And then, so, so passed on to her. Now, doesn't your son play hockey? Yeah. So my son was playing college hockey for Southern New Hampshire University. I can't believe how talented this kid is. I mean, it's amazing to see him play and how he does some of the stuff he does. I, the splits, goal to goal, post to post. I, I, some of the games get so competitive out there and, you know, you just see your son perform and it's just, a, it's a great feeling, right? <laughs> and and now my youngest, uh, my my twelve year old Madison is uh, is playing softball now too. So and just seeing how competitive and how great she's going to be, it's just amazing. I love it. I'm blessed genetically, that's for sure. Uh, yes, I would say so. And I'm trying to think about ice hockey. I have a friend whose son played ice hockey. I know they're probably many many hours freezing in a hockey rink watching your son play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's early mornings, late nights. Uh, yeah, it's uh, very competitive. Hockey's an awesome sport. I don't. Did Jim Thorpe play hockey at all? So <laughs> he was actually offered a professional contract to play hockey. Of course, for a team in Canada. Now, growing up, for sure, he uh, he must have played some hockey. <laughs> I don't think there was a sport he didn't play. <laughs> yeah, he he certainly did it all. I, I want to ask you, Jim, what do you think your great grandfather would have wanted his legacy to be? I truly think he wants to be a, a, a good person, a good father. I think that's number one, what he enjoyed the most was, you know, family and being around that. I think his accomplishments, I don't think he ever looked back and said, I'm the greatest in the world. No. That, that wasn't him. He was humble. He did what he did because that's what we did back then. That's what we do. And did I compete um, at a high level? Absolutely. But his friends and teammates would agree that they loved him. They loved him as a person. And I think that's what he would want his legacy to be. I'm, I'm a great person. I watched a documentary the other night, and I think I got this right, that early on in, in his track career, he would – sometimes be running away with it absolutely way in the lead and that he would still win, but he, he would let, he didn't want to be too far ahead of the other athletes. He, he didn't want to embarrass them. And <laughs> I think that that's what I saw. I thought, man, this, that speaks volumes, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. There's a lot of stories like that, not only on the athletic field in his personal life. I mean, my grandmother had mentioned a story to me once where they were out to breakfast and, um, they were eating and one of, one of the people came up to him and said, Hey, uh, how are you, Mr. Thorpe? Oh, it's great to see you. And he asked him how he's doing. And, and the guy said, well, you know, I'm going through some rough times and you know, having hard times. And Jim paid for his breakfast and then gave him every penny in his pocket. He said, here, I hope this helps. Wow. Good, good person. I think that's, I think that's what he wants his legacy to be. You know, the media hype, everything else that goes out there, what type of athlete he was, I think in the end, he just wanted to be a, a good person. Yeah. And, you know, he, 
as you said, when you, when you talked about his early days, he would keep running away from school. He wanted to go back home. Sounds like he would rather have been playing with his brother, some sort of sports with his brother or the rest of his family at a large family or just going fishing with his dad. It sounds like he, he kind of bonded with his dad a lot. So a family was obviously very important to him. Uh, his natural ability and his love of sports certainly became his career and it what, it's what made him famous and certainly was his way of life. Jim, how has being Jim Thorpe's great grandson, being descended from this famous athlete, incredible athlete, how has that impacted the person you are today? Tough question. I like it. Um, I, I think you have to first look at your family and I look at my family, my, my beautiful wife, my lovely kids. I just look at that and I'm so thankful that I have them in my life. And then you get opportunities to talk about and discuss a legend that you're related to. It, it's, it's one of the toughest things that brings you incredible pride. Um, sometimes joy, sometimes you don't like talking about it. There's some things that, uh, you know, that are said about him that, that I don't like and I don't agree with. But all in all, being part of, being part of his heritage is, uh, it, it brings a lot of pride to me, my family. I hope every one of them uh, looks up to him. And I hope he's looking down on us and blessing us and, and, and helping us through our lives, maybe make some better decisions than, than he had to make back then. I hope he's proud of us. Well, I am sure that he is, Jim, and this has just been an, an amazing interview. I, I'm so thankful that we've been able to talk, that we were able to connect with the man I used to hear bedtime stories about, <laughs> his family, I should say. It's pretty cool that we're still talking about him. You know, that's the thing. There's people who can fade out of history because for some reason or other, there's just too many generations in between. Culture is so different. Life is so different all of a sudden we start to forget about some of the uh, events or people who just impacted history. I think you and others who will keep his memory alive, Jim Thorpe's memory alive, are very important. All in all, though, what I'm hearing is that uh, he was a really wonderful dad and that you're all very proud of him. And it sounds like there's some really good athletic DNA going through your family. Could I borrow some of that? <laughs> You need to just like send some, we could just, uh, you know, unfortunately, I've always loved sports. I've never been a particularly good athlete, but I, uh, I love sports and I love reading about people, great athletes of, uh, of yesteryear, like, uh, like your great grandfather and Jesse Owens and uh, some of the greats from the past. Yeah. It, isn't it great to, to look back at some of those accomplishments and in the adversities they went through? I mean, it's those challenges that they faced that built that legend, you know, and not everybody knows it. So it's great. It's great that we're able to talk about it and get some of these topics out there and, and show, you know, it, if you looked at an Olympic champion, that's all they are is an Olympic champion to you. Well, no, they're people, they're humans, uh, just like us. I mean, he put his pants on the same way I do every day. So amazing, but what they were able to accomplish through all their adversities to build that legend, an amazing story. Priceless. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for giving us your time and this wonderful story about a wonderful man. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, James. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YH. YS podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.